I was kind of going through as I was preparing this talk is I kind of realized that it's really easy for us to look for things about ourselves when we're even engaging God's Word. Right? And kind of open up the Bible and be like, okay, what is there for me in this passage? Right? And I, I think sometimes we can do that. And there often is stuff that God wants to show us. But I think, first of all, um, when it comes to reading the Bible, what we need to look for first is engaging with God, is seeing who Jesus is. And, and I think something I've, I've seen in our world that, that kind of interests me is that there's a lot of anxiety. Right? If you look at any of the statistics and any of, even the, the young people in our culture, they struggle with more anxiety probably now than ever. And I believe part of that reason is actually how self-centered we've become. Right? I, I think 50 years ago, it would be so strange for someone to say, yeah, I have this whole page that's all about me. Right? And now we have Facebook, right? Everyone has Instagram, everyone has this stuff, and what we look for is how many likes we get, how many things we get, what, what, what do people think about me? Right? Even you can go through um, so much stuff online, even in friends circles, where people are so worried about what other people think or say or how they act. Right? When the reality is, is self, being self-centered actually stirs up anxiety in our hearts because we're so focused on ourselves and what people think about us that we become consumed with ourselves. And the littlest thing that goes wrong it can break down our identity. And it, it kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever been hiking and seen like this just a beautiful sunset or a gorgeous mountain view, but those are some of my favorite moments. And what I've realized is that in my favorite moments, when it's this beautiful view in front of you, the last thing you do is pull out a mirror and start looking at how your hair looks, right? The, the thing you do is you kind of take in this gorgeous view, you want to grab a photo, you want to capture the moment. The last thing you want to do is, so how do I look, right? Is, is my shirt done well? Am I sweating a little bit? The last thing you do is look at yourself. You, you just are like captivated by the beauty of what's in front of you. So as we kind of dive into Jude, we're going to look at verses 17 through 25. And Jude just has one chapter, so it's really easy to find. Uh, but I'd love for you guys to join with us there. I'm reading from the ESV, so it might be a little bit different from what we've got on our screen. Um, but I'd love for us to, as we read this passage, kind of take in the view of the things God loves and who God is. Because that is the heart of us engaging with God's Word. It says in verse 17 of Jude, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And to others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. So I love, I love this passage because what you see is this beautiful description, especially near the end, of who God is. But even in kind of the practical aspects of this passage, you see God is talking all about things that he can't stand. Things that actually, that he doesn't like, and that shows us mostly what God is like as well, right? He describes what I would call a cold church, and he describes a cold church as a place that is full of selfish desires, right? They're worldly, so they're careless about God's commands, they're full of division, and they're devoid of the Spirit. And what's interesting is if you look at the opposite of those, which just pa this passage will actually highlight to us, is we see some of the things God loves, Right? He loves <coughs> He loves us to be filled with His Spirit and continually empowered by the Spirit. Right? He wants us to be a people who care so much about what God says because that's the way to life the Bible teaches. And one of the things that really intrigued me was 
that this passage in June 17 through 19, which we're going to just highlight, I'll read to, a, to a, uh, it to us again. This is what it says. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. And that, to me, highlights what a, what a cold church is like. A church that's cold, unloving, unconnected from God. Right? I, and what was kind of interesting about that was it reminded me that God's church, His people are supposed to be on fire. His, his people are supposed to be a warm, inviting place. It kind of reminded me of this picture of almost a campfire on a cold night. I remember many, many times in the fall when it was getting cold that our dad would send us out as kids to get firewood, right? And the last thing we wanted to do was go home and come to the fire and it'd be out and it'd be cold, right? There's just something special about warming your hands by a warm, roaring fire. And I think that invitation is the same invitation God is giving the church. That as the church, we're supposed to have this image, have this identity as people who are a warm place, a place of refuge, where people want to go. And, and what's interesting is, is fast food places, I, I discovered this, they keep the temperature cooler. And they keep it cooler in there. I don't know if you've ever walked in, but I've got some little bit chilly in here, you know? Go to McDonald's or A&W or a place like that. And the reason is they actually keep it cooler because the cooler it is, the more people want to leave. Right? You're like, okay, I want to get my food, eat it, and get out. Right? You're not hanging out there for a long time because they want to kind of take your money, give you some mediocre food, and then kick you out. Um, but the reality is, is that as the church, we probably don't want to be like that. Right? And if you're anything like me, you want to be the kind of church that is a place where people find hope and healing and warmth and community and connection. And... The reality is, is as a church, a, a warm church, a place that's inviting and, and healthy is a church that's full of, as this passage says, prayer, love, mercy for the missing, and a spirit-led people. Those are kind of the opposite of what we talk about in verse 17 through 19. And, and I think particularly, one thing we see in our church today is division. Right? If you've been a part of the church over 2020 and kind of the previous few years, uh, it's marked by division. Right? We see that there's so much division. People who believe the same thing for the 99% of what they believe, they, they believe Jesus came and died for their sins and, and he sacrificed his life for us and that's the greatest gift humanity can ever receive. And yet, at the same time, there's this sense where we just can't even hang out if we disagree on something minor, like politics, or what we, di what we agree about, even a secondary doctrine issue, right? And th that's heartbreaking, especially for so many young people. I've had so many conversations as I've stepped into being a youth pastor where people just question me, like, Matt, why are there so many denominations? Why can't Christians just get along? Right? And I don't think they have an issue with there being different gathering places like this church and that church. They just see how much kind of anger and hate there is between other churches. We're, we're, as one pastor describes it, it's almost like we're taking a sledgehammer to God's temple. Because that's how God describes the church, right? We're his temple, we're his dwelling place. And the last thing, if you're a lover of God, if you love Jesus, the last thing you want to do is destroy where God lives, where God makes his presence most evident. Yet that's what we do in the church when there is so many divisions and so much anger and hate between other believers. And the gospel is such a beautiful message because it inspires unity. Right? I don't have to agree with the person who maybe goes to the Catholic Church or the Anglican Church. Right? And there's certain core things we have to agree on to be called Christians. But outside of the primary core things that Jesus is God, that he came in the flesh, that he came to save us and transform our lives, that we're sinners and that we need to follow Jesus' commands, outside of that, there's actually very little that, we should, that should stir up just hate and anger. Because Jesus, when he talks about the gospel, when he talks about having faith and following him, he says, love your neighbor. And not just your neighbor who you like, but the enemy who you shouldn't like, who hates you. Jesus' invitations that we love one another. In fact, in, 
One of my favorite passages in John 17, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, his invitation to his disciples and his prayer to his Father in heaven is, Lord, let them be one as you and I are one. And then he goes on to say, that is how the world will know that they are, my, that they are mine and, and that the Christians are authentic. And, and that, to me, is one of those interesting passages that, that challenges me. Because it's hard for me to see people who I think are doing things that are wrong, right? If I think someone's making a bad decision with who they're voting for. Or maybe with a decision they're making about maybe it's health care or vaccination or being not vaccinated. Whatever the disagreement, it can be challenging because you care for that person. You think they're maybe making a wrong decision. Yet the reality that Jesus invites us to is despite the fact that they make decisions that are different than you, love needs to be the first command. We say, okay, I just want to pursue what's best for you. And that's what we see as Jude saying about the church. Because this passage isn't about the world. Because the world is, is already worldly. The problem is when the church becomes worldly. When the church becomes just like the culture that surrounds, that's outside, that the culture that doesn't believe in Jesus. And I think God is inviting us as a church to respond to the division we see, to the, many of the, 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 the hate we see in our, our church and our world. And this is such an interesting passage because even in verse 20 and 21, it highlights the response to a cold church. And this is what it says in verse 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. And, and I love that passage because it highlights the response to a church that's unloving and cold is to actually start building yourself up and praying in the Holy Spirit. The response isn't just to tell them they're doing something wrong, but it's actually say, it's asking God to say, hey, change me, build me up, make me a more loving person, make me a more compassionate person, make me someone who, who so demonstrates what it means to have God's heart, what it means to be like Jesus. And... I don't know if you've heard this before, but there's a phrase that I often heard in college from my friends who would go to a different church. Maybe they didn't have as great a speaker, great a worship band. And what they would say is, this church doesn't feed me. And my response that I almost instantly wanted to have was, unless you're a baby, you shouldn't need someone else to feed you. And I didn't always say it because I, I figured that compassion and understanding and a little bit of grace was more important than just saying my frustrated feelings. But the reality is, is as Christians, the, the, the Bible doesn't just teach that we should go to a pastor and expect him to give us one message, one scripture verse that will carry us through an entire week. But the idea is that God wants us to be continually in his word. Right, the, the title of my message today, I titled it The Beauty of Abiding in Christ. Because the goal of building ourselves up isn't just to white knuckle it, isn't just to say, I'm going to build myself up, I'm going to be better today. Right, because I don't know about you, but whenever I try just to say, grit, like grab, clench my fist, say, I'm going to be better today, it usually doesn't work. Right, And even if I do get better, usually the opposite happens where I start getting prideful. I'm like, man, I'm way better than everyone else. Look at what I did. I achieved all this. I'm way holier than they are. I'm way better. And that's just the opposite of where we want to go as well. Right? So the only way to truly be built up in Christ is by abiding in Jesus. And we do that. And, and abiding is a really simple word. Right? We don't use it much in our, our culture today, but I love it. Because uh, Jesus, he talks about it, I think, in John 14 and and what he says is that abide in me and you will bear fruit, right? And the kind of trees that bear fruit are the ones that are growing. A dying tree shouldn't be bearing much fruit, right? And I don't know if you've ever planted an apple tree. I know um, we have an apple tree in our place, and it's too big right now. It actually needs some pruning. But it just has fruit that is even higher than we can get to. We're climbing on ladders. We're, like, whacking it with sticks, trying to get the fruit down. It's just bundles and bundles and, like, boxes and boxes of apples, right? There's more than we could ever eat. And the reality is, is that tree is growing and healthy because it's reaching down to the, the depth and, and the soil and the, and the water, the, the stuff that gives it life. And the vision that the Bible shows us, that Jude writes to us about, and that Jesus teaches 
is that we are to build ourselves up by abiding in Christ. That we can't do it by just white-knuckling it, by closing our eyes, by gritting our teeth and saying, I am going to do it. Because if we learn anything from Jesus, we can't do it. Right? That's the entire point of the gospel is that there is a lack in our hearts where we can't actually achieve perfection. We need Jesus. And for me, that just challenges me as a, even as a, a pastor and a leader, it can be difficult to dive into the Word of God, right? And even if you are, are someone like, I look to my wife, she's someone who's got a very good schedule, she's very rhythm, and I, I'm kind of the spontaneous one who's out there doing crazy things randomly. And then sometimes I'm staying up and praying. I'm like, God, I need to reconnect with you. And my wife's like, I'm going to go to bed. I talked with God this morning. You just need to catch up. Um, but the, the, the beauty of engaging with God's word is that it doesn't just have to be kind of a, a boring rhythm. But there is this beauty that comes with it because you're not just reading the Bible to check off the box. You're reading it until you encounter God. Right? Because that's the purpose of this book. It isn't just a, a manual for life. Right? It has good stuff in it for us, but primarily the Bible enables us to encounter and meet with God. Right? That that is what we're invited to do. And, and, as, and as I was praying about this, this message, one of the things that kind of came to mind as well um, was how much work it takes to grow good things, right? Me and my wife, we were, I was looking at my lawn the other day, especially at the start of summer when we just had purchased our house and everything was kind of growing. And what I realized as I looked around was there was all these dandelions. And I, I don't know who asked them to grow there, but I sure didn't. Um, and the reality was is those weeds, those dandelions, all that stuff, it grew up so much faster and so much quicker than all the grass around it. Right? And in fact, I need to kill some of it, destroy some of the weeds so our lawn wouldn't be just full of weeds and gross stuff all over the place. And I think that reality is similar to our hearts, right? Where it is so much easier for weeds and selfishness and division to grow in our hearts, right? Where we, it is so much easier to just, oh, on a Saturday afternoon, on a Sabbath, saying, okay, God, I know it's a Sabbath, I'm not going to do any work, but I'm also not going to engage with you. Right, where you're just gonna, I'm just gonna tune you out, God. I'm gonna tune everything out because life's too much. I've seen too much division. I've seen too much challenge. I've seen done too much work, and we just want to turn everything off. And sometimes we even turn off our attention from God. Right, and what happens when we do that in our lives is other things grow up and take the place that we've excluded God from. Right, if if God's not filling your life, something else will. If God is not filling your time, something else will, right? And it's probably going to show up as selfishness. And it won't look like it at first. But like, I'm just doing this because I need it, right? And then you start telling yourself, I, I need this time. I need this thing. I need. And it starts becoming all about you. And as soon as you don't get the little things that are your preferences or your decisions or your likes, you get getting angry and you don't know why, right? And it comes from that place of, depending ultimately on yourself, saying this thing is what gives me life, not Jesus. This activity or this break or this thing that I do, maybe it's even sinful. You say, I need that in my life. I won't survive without it because there's a lack of faith and a lack of dependence on Jesus, right? So in our, our hearts, just like a garden or a good lawn, we need to make sure we're pulling up weeds, we say, okay, God, I've got to crucify my selfish desires. I've got to crucify those desires where I just want for me, right, where I don't want to serve anyone else and say, okay, no, God, I'm crucifying that. I'm going to actually start serving. Uh, I'm going to crucify those desires of the flesh and make space for God to give life. See, and I love that Jude highlights that when we're building ourselves up, that a core part of it is prayer in the Holy Spirit. Um, I was listening to a sermon just this morning. It was Don't Quench the Spirit by Sam Storms. And it just reminded me of the invitation that God has for us to be people who are so open and saying, God, I need your spirit to fill me and empower me. 
right? Because if we're, and he, he described in a way I'd never heard it before, where he said, even if you're just depending on yourself, to maybe do something in ministry because he was talking to pastors. If you're depending on yourself to do ministry or reach out to this person or take care of your family or lead in your ministry or your job place or work or whatever, that he said that is actually quenching the spirit because God's spirit isn't just about doing flashy signs, but it's actually about empowering us every day. Right, The primary role of the Holy Spirit is to show us Jesus, to, to bring us back to that gospel experience that we had at first, right? where we know it's, it's about grace. It's about God's goodness transforming me, not just me doing it in my own strength, but God transforming us by his strength. See, I, I believe you can even pray with, in the flesh, right? And I think we've seen it at times, even if... We're, we're, we're more connected to that charismatic side of things. Maybe you even speak in tongues, right? But the reality is many of us can even pray in the flesh. And I believe it often looks like just praying for things. God, give me, just give me this, give me this, give me this. And we pray more looking at ourselves than we do looking at God, right? I don't know if you're anything like me, but it gets really easy to get stuck in a mindset where you just look at yourself, right? God, my issue is so big. Right? I just want to see this happen in my life. I need this to happen. And it's good to pray that God would do stuff in our life. But I believe there's times in, in all of our prayer times, we just need to set that aside. It says in, in the Psalms to enter God's courts with thanksgiving. Right? It's, a, it's essentially enter his presence telling God what you're thankful for. Not just saying, God, I need this, I need this, I need this. Because that's praying according to the things you're worried about in the flesh and it, it, I believe at times when we let that consume us, it gives way to an unhealthy prayer life that is focused more on ourselves than on God. And one of the things that's so beautiful about this passage, and I just feel like reading it over, it's, it's in verse 24. Because this is such a beautiful prayer that we can pray. It's, it's titled the doxology. It says, Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, be majesty, be dominion, be authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. And it's a short little prayer, but I believe it even shifts and reminds us that this book that Jude was writing isn't just about these people's problems, but it's about the God who can solve those problems, right? It's looking to the God who is our hope. Because our hope isn't just, if I pray, then God will bring a solution. Our hope is in the God who can bring the solution, right? That we're looking to Jesus, that he knows our needs before we even ask. So our primary focus should be say, okay, God, I want you to be in my life. I want you to be present. Because maybe this health issue or this work issue or this job issue is going to stick around. But often what God wants to do in the challenge is he wants to be with us and be present in it. That even though the challenge is difficult and we can't stand it, right? I was t chatting with my wife uh, on the way up and we were talking like, I wonder what happened. Like, how many shipwrecks was Paul in again? And, and I was kind of thinking like, this guy, this Paul, this missionary who went out all across the known world wrote a big bunch of the, the New Testament. He was in a bunch of, he was in multiple shipwrecks, right? He was stranded. He was like, Left alone, he probably felt scared and worried and freaked out. And all the time, we go back to Paul, and his main thing isn't, this is my problem, I need it fixed. It's like, this is my God, and he can do what he wants. If he fixes my, my problem, hallelujah. If he doesn't, and I go to heaven, hallelujah. He's just praising God, regardless of the situation he's in, because he knows that God can do something in his life that is way better than any negative situation could take away. Right, that God is doing something bigger. And in verse 21, as we kind of carry on, it says, um, it says this, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And when we read this passage, keep yourself in God's love, sometimes, if you're anything like me when I was younger, I told this to our, our youth a few days ago, but one of the things I did when I was a kid, I, I was pretty young at the time, like eight years old, and I thought that 
kind of going to heaven in prayer with something you kind of, kind of pray yourself in and out of, right? So I'd be like, God, save me. Just kidding. I'm good. And then I'd be like, no, God, really, like, save me. I, I need it. Um, and it was this moment where kind of looking back as my faith has matured and developed is I realized that, that God's love isn't something we just jump in and out of, right? We don't jump like, oh, God loves me right now, and he doesn't anymore because I did this bad thing. But the reality is, is that God loves us despite the things that are wrong in our lives. He loves us past the sin. In fact, Romans teaches that, that God loved us even while we still hated God, right? That, that is the kind of love that Jesus invites us to have, not only for our friends, but for our enemies, where we take on that same attitude of Jesus where I, I believe Jesus on the cross, he demonstrated that love isn't just a feeling or an emotion, but it's an attitude where he says, I want to do what's best ultimately and eternally for the people in my life. And I, and I think that should be the same for us, where we look at others and say, I want to see what's ultimately best for them, even if it means my sacrifice, even if it costs me a lot, because it's worth it. So keep yourselves in God's love does not mean you can jump in and out of God's love, but it does mean you can step in and out of doing what God loves, right? God loves us regardless, just there are things we know that God doesn't love, right? We see it in the Word. We see it even in this passage where he's talking about that God doesn't want us to be a people marked by division, marked by a lack of the Spirit, marked by destructive practices that will take us down, right? I think of of sin being this, this image in Jeremiah where it says God is crying like a river because he sees the sin of his people, right? That's God's heart for sin is that it breaks him. It hurts God. It wounds him because he knows that sin is killing us, that sin is destructive and ruins our lives. And I think of it kind of in the, the image of marriage, right? I can't be loving my wife if I'm cheating on her, right? It's kind of one or the other. I'm either, like, in love with my wife or someone else. It isn't both at the same time. Because no matter those feelings, what you feel in the moment, what really matters is your actions because your actions show what you truly believe, right? Your behavior shows what you really believe. And the same goes with God. You cannot be loving God while sinning, right? You can feel good about God while you go and do something that's sinful, but you can't be authentically loving him. You can't be authentically loving him if you're saying, God, I reject the things you have for me. Right? There are, there are lots of people in our world, especially today, even in the church, who will tell us that, yeah, you still love God, but you can go cheat on your spouse. You can go divorce them. You can go, you can go um, sin. You can lie. You can steal. If it's right, you just have to feel it. God doesn't really care, right? There's lots of people who would say that. But that's just not the reality. You, when you're loving God, you're obeying his commands. You're saying, okay, God, not how far can I get away from things to where it's like, okay, how close to sin can I get? But as Christians, we should be like, how close to, to living exactly perfect can I get? How close to living just like Jesus can I get? Because that's the invitation of God. And, and that is... A marker of someone who has authentic faith is you want to do what God is inviting you to, right? That even if he's inviting you to something that's a major sacrifice in your life, that you're like, okay, God, this is going to be hard, but I'm willing to do it because I know that the reward's greater, that it's better to serve, it's better to love these people, it's better to sacrifice my life for others because that is what God's invitation is. And in verse We'll read verse 22 and 23. It says, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire, and to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And this is one of those parts of this passage that's markedly different from a church that is cold and unloving. Because a church that is unloving is often apathetic to what other people are doing. Right? They're often apathetic. And what that means is it's a word that says essentially, you do you. And I would say that marks our culture right now, doesn't it? You do you is kind of the motto of the 2020s. 
right, where it's whatever you want, whatever you feel like, go and do it. Well, that's not actually love. See, love, when you love someone, there's oftentimes big disagreements because you're saying, no, I don't think that's best for you, right? Ultimately, we can't control people. We look at Jesus. He doesn't try to control us. He doesn't force us in to anything. But what he does is he extends the invitation. He says, come, follow the better way, right? That's the gospel where Jesus invites his disciples to follow him. He doesn't force them to. He says, come, follow me. I have the way of life right? Come, follow me, drink of the well that will give you life that lasts forever. And that is how God wants us to live and respond to a a hurting world, is to extend the invitation, hey, I don't think that's right. Here is the invitation to what is better, what I've experienced of God's blessing, of his goodness, of his life. And I think this is such an image that should strike us as Christians, is snatching others from the fire because that is that picture of hell. And one of the interesting things I've really discovered about hell is Jesus didn't go preaching hell to people who didn't believe in God, right? Because if you don't believe in God, you probably don't believe in hell anyways. What he did is he looked at Christians, people who are already followers of Jesus, and he said, yeah, hell is real. Let it motivate you to save others, right? Hell, I believe, is more of a motivation to Christians to love their neighbor because they believe the stakes are so high. Not something where we try to scare people into believing in Jesus because that doesn't really last, does it? Right? Just If you've ever done something just out of fear, kind of obedience, be like, oh, I'll do that because I don't want this person to hurt me or hit me or whatever. Right? Or I don't want to get punished in school or the principal to get me. doesn't mean you have changed your heart. You don't actually want to do that thing. You just don't want the punishment. See, God doesn't want his church to be a place that, well, I don't want the punishment, so I'm just going to follow God. I'm just going to believe Jesus. But God's invitation is, and even it talks about it in Scripture, his kindness is what leads us to repentance, where we want what God has, and we want the, the beautiful things, the goodness of God. We want the gospel to shift and change us, not just we're afraid of punishment. And if, if I could simplify Christianity into three things, I would say it kind of falls into this category. It's build up others, abide in Christ, and save souls, right? Because as we're people on this planet, one of the things that, that a preacher said to me that I was like, that, that can't be true. He said, our why as Christians is to fulfill the Great Commission, right, which is baptize people and teach them to follow Jesus, essentially save souls, as this passage describes. And that kind of challenged me. I was like, I I don't know if that's, like, that's part of it, but I wouldn't say that's all of it. And he kind of went on to to elaborate. And what he said was like, yes, we we need to worship God and glorify him forever, right? Enjoy God and and experience the presence of God, gather with other Christians. But he said the, the difference is we can only save people while we're breathing on this earth. That is the one thing we will never get to do again in heaven, is save people. We will never get to preach the gospel again to people who don't know Jesus in heaven. And that is why Paul and Jude and all the biblical authors made incredible sacrifices. I look at Paul, he just sacrificed everything. He said, you know what, like, I'm, not, I'm not holding anything back. Right? He's like, I'm not even going to get married because I believe I can preach the gospel better unmarried because I can go wherever I want. I can get shipwrecked. I don't have to take care of my home and a family and a wife. He's like, I could just go. Right? And that is God's invitation to us is that as people, we, were, we should realize that if we've still got breath in our lungs, there is still people God wants us to reach. There is still people that God wants us to show his love to. There are still people that God wants us to be a part of loving and being his hands and feet involved in their lives. That our purpose doesn't end once we believe in the gospel, but it continues on. See, one pastor, he said this, we should be, we should be willing to do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Jesus. And what I'm so impressed with is he didn't just say those words, but his church backs it up, right? He has gotten the Bible out with his church probably to more people than, than I even thought would be possible with a little app called the YouVersion Bible app, 
And his name is Craig Rochelle with Life Church. And what so impressed me was that they sacrificed so much to make the Bible free to people and translate into different languages. And they're sacrificing so much because they believe that the Word of God has power and that it needs to be in everyone's pocket. Right? If we have access to Facebook and social media and so much garbage on the internet, he believes we should have access to the gospel on our phones as well. And I love that because it's such the heart of Jesus that God is going to go wherever it is that people are who need reaching. And, and I would ask you this question. If you looked at your life, would you say your life is marked by those three goals I read out? Are you building up others in the church? Are you making it your decision to abide in God, to remain in Christ, right, to make him your home? Or are you looking to try and save people? Is that your life's work? Because as Christians, our, our life's work isn't just to kind of do our own thing and just be like, I feel like this is my thing, right? But to say, okay, God, what is it that you have for me? Because even though we can feel that our identity is caught up in this and that, and often our personality is how God uses us to reach people, we shouldn't get so caught up in, I'm just going to do my thing and I'm not going to listen to God because that's not really me. See, if we believe that God is our creator, then he knows us better than we know ourselves. Then he knows what will really give us purpose and identity and value and what will really give us the identity we crave. See, Another pastor that I, I know of and quite respect from Broadway Church in Vancouver, he said this, and it challenged me even as a pastor. He said, are you willing to sacrifice the preferences of the found for the needs of the lost, right? And I, I think even in my life, it's so easy, especially once you just get into the rhythm of going to church to start thinking so much about your preferences, isn't it, right? We can say, even I've heard, and I catch myself doing this more often than I would like, where I kind of ask, like, how was church today? I don't know. I didn't really like the worship. It's like, well, it wasn't really for me, right? The, the, we were worshiping God, not Matthew and my preferences. And I think something I would, I would challenge you in today is to kind of evaluate your heart and ask, what have I made the most important thing? What have I been most focused on? Because I think us getting caught up in, in so many things in our world and so many things that are, are selfish can often easily distract us from the great things God wants to do. And I, I, would, I would like to kind of just imagine for a moment what the world would be like if there were more Christians who, who put other people's needs before their own. Wouldn't that be beautiful, right? I, I think of even just this church. Imagine if everyone in this room kind of took on that responsibility, say, hey, how, how can I serve, right? Even to the point where we're saying, like, the, the greater the cost, the better. If Jesus calls me to sacrifice everything, to sell my house, to feed someone, the better, because Jesus is calling me to do it. Because it's not just something we're doing based in the flesh, but it's something we're doing saying, okay, Jesus, I'm just doing this because you're inviting me to it, right? I don't want us to be unwise or, or just be like, oh, I need to do this and kind of feel guilt-tripped into, into anything because that's not how God loves us to give. God wants us to give from a cheerful heart, right? He wants us to be people who say, God, yes, I want to give to you. He doesn't want to, he doesn't need to kind of, well, I need this from you, ha, 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 so God can build a bigger church, right? God doesn't need any more money. He doesn't need any more stuff, but what he really wants is our hearts, right? That's why we give. That's why even for me and Hannah, even though we're pastors, we still make a practice in our life of saying, hey, we're going to tithe. We're going to have 10%, even though sometimes it's like, man, we could really spend that on, on this or that, or if we save that, that would make life a lot easier. It's like, okay, God, we're, we're doing this because we feel you've called us to it. And God, it's not ours anyways, it's yours, right? And as Christians, the invitation is to be people who live life with open hands and open hearts, ready to both receive what God wants to give us, but also to share what he's already given us. And that is what I think would shape our world in such a powerful way, 
And I think as if we want to be a church where unbelievers see us and they're like, man, I want what these people have. We've got to make sure we're abiding in Christ, that we have something that's worthy of outsiders wanting. Because I think many, many, many struggles of the North American church have been because we've filled our lives up with maybe Christian songs and Christian music and Christian things but we haven't been filled up with the Spirit of God, that we haven't been as full, uh, abiding in Christ day to day, just cherishing and loving Jesus as much as we're invited to do. Because no matter how much you love God, there's always more, right? That we don't ever come to the end of God, be like, okay, I, I completed Christianity, checked off the box, I'm done, right? We don't ever get to the end. And that's the beautiful good news of the gospel is that there's always more good things that God has for us. So even as I kind of invite the band to come on up, I want to quickly pray. And let's just, as we kind of step into the final few songs of worship, let's just ask God to show us what it would be like if we really took to heart the words of Jude, where we built ourselves up, where we kept praying in the Holy Spirit, where we looked more at who God is than who we are, and we started living in unity for the kingdom of God. Let's pray.